Hello, welcome to the Friday, October 18th, 2019 edition of the Sands Heart Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today we got a diary from Jan Copriva, our newest handler actually, and he's writing about some of the shortcomings of SPF, the center policy framework that's often used to discriminate against spam and phishing attempts. As an example, he's using a malicious email that he received that claimed to come from DHL.com. DHL.com does use uh, the SPF record, but there are sort of two problems with SPF. First of all, it's not actually checking the from header in the email that's being displayed to the user. Instead, it's only verifying the from in the email envelope, which actually is typically not displayed to the user, maybe you'll see it as part of a received header within the headers of the particular email. So pretty easy to make an email still look like it's coming from DHL.com to the user, while SPF or the mail server, when it checked SPF, did think it came from a different domain. Secondly, a lot of uh, SPF records are actually not that well written. For example, you may see a question mark all at the end. And this is actually what Jan saw here. The sender here was then shipping.com and they're using this question mark all in the end of the SPF record, which essentially means, well, I'm specifying which mail servers may send email for my domain but I'm not limiting it to these servers and everybody else actually may send email as well. So this is often done to sort of prevent false positives and prevent email from being dropped, but really bad practice. It really sort of invalidates the idea of having an SPF record in the first place. So probably a good idea to take a good look at your SPF records and also, well, a good time to reinforce with your user is that that from header really doesn't mean a thing. And if you ever purchased a domain that had been used in the past, you may have been, well, at the receiving end of a lot of email that was uh, directed at prior owners of that domain. A purchaser of such a domain, Aaron Stadler, recently actually ran into a particular issue here and that relates to PayPal accounts. Apparently, the domain he purchased is linked to a number of PayPal accounts accounts and now he's receiving things like for example password reset messages and the like and well uh, since PayPal and others pretty much use the email address to authenticate you it's possible that he could now completely take over these PayPal accounts. Now that's not what he wants to do he actually would like PayPal to somehow invalidate these email addresses maybe notify the users of these accounts or just lock them but apparently PayPal is not able to do so. Certainly an interesting issue and I don't think that Aaron is alone with this, nor do I think that PayPal is the only company affected by this problem. But given that with PayPal it usually involves money, it probably would certainly be a target and security company Digital Shadows has taken a look at typo squatting domains associated with candidates for the 2020 presidential election here in the United States. Well, uh, they looked in about 550 typo squat domains for 34 different candidates and found that the majority of uh, these domains are pretty much simple redirects. Many of these redirects end up at a competing candidate's website. Of course, it's not clear if any of the campaigns are behind this or if these are just some well-meaning supporters that registered these domains. 
Another good part of these domains is essentially non-malicious, just hosting various other content, or maybe in some cases trying to sell something like buttons or the like, but not associated with the particular campaign. Finally, and actually a fairly small number of domains are essentially just non-configured sites that show default pages, maybe making some little bit of money here in parts with ads. At this point, uh, they don't really point out anything too malicious uh, with uh, these sites, no malware or the like, but of course the content of any of these sites could change at any time. Typo squatting, pretty old issue, no real great solution for this. Personally, I don't believe the solution is to buy all of these different domains sort of preemptively. You pretty much can't cover them all. But well, uh, today it's also Friday and I have with me today another STI student, Christopher Hurley's. Uh, Christopher, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name, as you said, Christopher Hurley. I'm uh, coming to you from Doha, Qatar, where I work at Northwestern University. What about uh, your paper? Can you introduce a little bit your paper? I think it was about OS query and such, which is always a topic I like. Being that I work at a university, we're often uh, people heavy, but money poor. So finding uh, free ways to solve problems is always uh, at the top of our list of things to be able to do. When I found OS Query and uh, Fleet, along with Elasticsearch uh, as an open source detection, endpoint detection and response, I thought it was really a, a great topic to, to look deeper into. So uh, can you talk a little bit about OS Query? OS Query, as I understand it, uh, basically gives sort of a SQL interface to all of your configuration data, at least. That's sort of how I've seen it introduced. Uh, is this true or uh, anything, uh, any way how you used it in particular? Uh, I mean, in a nutshell, I think you, you've got it. Uh, you know, storing uh, configuration data uh, in a platform agnostic tool uh, that's then queryable using standard SQL statements is kind of at the heart of what OS Query will do for you. Now, you mentioned that you're working for a university. Uh, one problem I always hear with universities is that you have limited access kind of to your endpoints and you know, uh, limited policies so that you can enforce. How did OS Query sort of fit into this environment? So for us, um, we started out in the labs. Um, you know, any, any public machine uh, that gets used by students uh, or visitors will, will get OS Query. Uh, we also have a great deal of ability here to put agents onto staff and faculty machines uh, using uh, a few other technologies for endpoint deployment. And because we're a heterogeneous environment, we have, you know, uh, Macs, we have Windows and Linux. Uh, OS Query was a really good fit for us to sort of complement our uh, endpoint protection solution. And OS Query, uh, isn't it Facebook that sort of came up with it? So if they use the environment scaling, I guess, is not really a problem? Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, Facebook definitely uh, you know, built this and, and gave it out to the community. Um, they also give a lot of uh, wonderful query packs uh, that, that I've used as sort of the starting point in my paper to, to kind of show that you, know, you can get started right away um, with everything that Facebook has given you. Now, in your paper, uh, you're talking about the Elastic Stack. So all that OS query data, I guess, you know, is then ending up in Elastic Stack and becomes uh, more searchable and relatable to other data. Then, uh, what sort of the clue that you have between OS query and Elastic Stack? How did you actually get the data from one tool into the other? The logs actually end up first into the fleet server, and and the fleet server is, is where you can instruct OS query uh, what what queries it should run on a, uh, and on what sort of time schedule. Uh, and then uh, in the Elastic Stack, there's a little program called FileBeat. And what FileBeat does is it just basically moves uh, logs from, from one place to another. So um, FileBeat being on the fleet server, um, it just takes those logs and, and pushes them right into the Elastic Stack. Now, can you walk us maybe through sort of a detection scenario or so uh, to show us uh, what uh, particular logs you got from OS Query uh, for a particular uh, kind of malicious activity? 
Well, you know, some, some really easy ones is just uh, simply looking and monitoring startup locations, which is a very easy query. It's, you know, select star from startup. And, uh, and you can do that as a differential uh, query. So anytime the startup items on a machine change, it's going to create a log entry. And then you can very easily see those log entries on the Elastic uh, stack through, through the Kibana dashboard. So I think that's probably, you know, just a, an example of a very simple way that you can quickly find, you know, a state change to a machine that may be unexpected uh, and, and what you would start with an investigation. So essentially the way you would do this is uh, set up that OS query uh, command essentially to, or query, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. to get a list of the newly changed added startup uh, locations, use Fleet to periodically run this query, and uh, then Fleet via FileBeat will send these events uh, to uh, Elastic. Yeah, I think you've got it. Okay, yeah, yeah. so that, that sounds really interesting. So it, it really gives you fairly fine-grained access to uh, these uh, system parameters, and uh, I guess you're not really overwhelmed then either, or if you're just looking at the change. Uh, if you would log all of the startup locations, let's say every five minutes, that probably would be quite a bit of data, but only logging the, the changes uh, keeps that data quite manageable. Or... Yeah, that's absolutely the case. Um, and OS Query does have the ability to do what it calls a snapshot. And the snapshot will would you know log every time you run the snapshot, every single uh, startup item. But generally speaking, you'll just be running differential queries that will really only log when they detect a change. Now, can you give us a feel for the resource requirements? Uh, like, you know, um, how big of an Elastic server do you need for uh, your particular environment, and how many endpoints are you monitoring there? Uh, we're running. I mean, we're we're pretty small. We're we're looking at about two hundred endpoints. Um, and we, we run two servers. One is for fleet. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, it's nothing special. Um, maybe four gigs of RAM and, uh, you know, on a, a red hat box. And then, uh, uh, elastic search is, um, a little beefier. The log stash, requ log stash requires about eight gigabytes of RAM, you know, and, and maybe a dual CPU for us. But, you know, we're only ingesting those logs for uh, OS Query. We're not ingesting logs from across the organization as a whole uh, for this solution. So uh, very manageable, basically, and not terribly expensive or so to buy the hardware uh, for this particular system. That's correct. And uh, we did everything through virtualization. So, you know, the, the, app, the resource cost is, is almost uh, nothing. That, that's really neat. Uh, now, uh, one uh, particular piece of malware that uh, you looked into in your paper uh, was this JRAD Adwin. Um, can you tell us a little bit how this uh, particular uh, malware sort of expressed itself in these logs? So uh, the most interesting thing, uh, the, the first thing that I noticed about what it had done uh, was that it disabled the uh, user account control on the Windows machine, uh, which OS Query had logged and, and made a note of. Um, and, and once I found that, I started looking into, um, you know, I, I just logged into the, uh, the fleet server and started asking questions specifically of that machine uh, uh, based on the um, epoch time of the UAC uh, disabled change. Uh, if that makes sense. I, I, I then, um, using that, that epoch time, I started to look for other changes, um, such as what files had been created at that time. Uh, and that's when I found that um, the entire uh, Java application had been copied over in from the system space to the user space. Um, and I also noticed that a couple of startup items uh, also around that same epoch time uh, had appeared uh, with very dubious names like uh, desktop.ini, which uh, last time I checked is not supposed to be a startup uh, object. Um, and then, uh, you know, I started to dig into the registry. This is where I found, I think, the one weakness um, when it came to OS Query searchability uh, was its ability to um, look recursively through the registry of a Windows machine. 
it's less of a problem with uh, Unix and Mac because everything's a file and you're just looking for, you know, when things were changed. But uh, it would tell me when a specific registry key would, was changed. It's just whenever I needed to do that recursive search, it would start to fail. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Any workaround for this or uh, anything else that you did to sort of make up for that? Uh, you know, I did start to monitor some very specific uh, registry keys, uh, you know, uh, just to make sure that, you know, if I if I knew the exact key, I, I could monitor it. Um, but, you know, just, uh, and I did set up, so any future installation of JRAD, I would find those registry keys. But, uh, you know, if it's just registry changes that I'm looking for and I need to search recursively, um, I found that to be a problem. Yeah, interesting. So what's next for you? Uh, almost done with the program or a lot more classes to go? Uh, you know, I'm having too much fun. I hope I'm never done. But uh, I'm, a, I'm about a third of the way through. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on, um, let's see, just finished the uh, GCPM course. Uh, I'll be doing that test this Saturday, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. This is my first foray into the uh, fans management courses. And I, I was actually su really surprised at how much I enjoyed learning uh, security from a, a more management perspective than from just a, a diehard technical perspective, which is what I'm accustomed to. I mean, some of the best times I ever had was in your class reading packets. Yeah, it's hard to beat reading packets. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, thanks for your time and uh, hope to run into you at the future SANS event. And that's it also for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.